there's going to be people who do better than you and that's kind of a surprise and then there's going to be people who do worse than you and you might think like i love their book how did that happen Welcome to Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, the weekly podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letter and discuss their journey from first spark to day of publication. I am your host, Sarah Nicholas. I hope you're enjoying the stories authors are sharing with you. If you are, please consider leaving a review on iTunes, Podchaser, or Audible, or sharing the episode on social media. If you're interested in supporting the show, go to patreon.com slash pubtalklive. Mike Chen is the author of We Could Be Heroes, here and now and then, and a beginning at the end. He has contributed to Star Wars from a certain point of view and covered geek culture for sites such as Tor.com, The Mary Sue, and Star Trek.com. In previous lives, he has been a musician, DJ, aerospace engineer, and credentialed NHL reporter. Mike lives in the Bay Area with his wife, daughter, and rescue animals. So please welcome Mike to the show. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. Of course. I try to be very transparent about my journey because I feel like there's always been a lot of people who've helped me along the way. So hopefully this will help someone else. Awesome. So we're going to talk about your publication journey today. We're going to start at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. When did you first start getting interested in writing and how long did it take before you started getting serious about pursuing publication? Mm. So there's... There's various stages to that because there's like, you know, the childhood stage where I, I was drawing a lot of comics uh, of my own where I was like crossing over characters from this universe into this universe. But I, I think it's kind of funny because I look back on, I still remember a lot of those stories and they're very much in the vein of the stuff that I write now, which is like slice of life speculative fiction. So even though I would take something from like Robotech, which is a very like epic you know fate of the galaxy serialized cartoon story um but then i would like draw uh, cartoons of like you know what, what were the characters doing in the mess hall between missions like that sort of stuff so that that kind of thing was always there and then i took a creative writing class at college i went to uc davis so go aggies and my teacher she said that I, I wrecked the curve, which was always nice to hear. <laughs> and she said that I should uh, change majors. And I'm like, I, I've already, you know, done three and a half years of engineering school, and my parents have paid for three and a half years of engineering school, so that that's not going to fly. But she told me, she told me to keep writing. She encouraged me to join critique groups and just to work on the whole thing. And uh, at that point, that was in, in 2000. At the same time. I knew I was pretty good at writing. Like it just came really naturally. And the internet sports journalism phase, it was like the early phase of sports journalism uh, online. So like if you had your own blog and you wrote consistently and you wrote high quality stuff, you would eventually get found because people would be searching for that. And so I did that for a while. Like that, My blog got absorbed by Fox Sports. And then I started writing for... Uh, Comcast Sports, which was known as Versus back then, and I would contribute to Yahoo Sports from time to time, places like that. So I did the the sports media thing for a while while I was working as a technical writer in the Bay Area, and I hit a point where I felt like I wanted to write stories again, like creative fiction, because I felt like I did everything that I wanted to do with with the sports stuff. So I I retired from that, and then I took it seriously probably starting around like 2008 or so. And I was writing contemporary fiction. So if, if you know my work, that's very family or personal interpersonal relationship driven. It's not epic science fiction. It's not epic fantasy. And I started off putting that in contemporary settings. And I just felt like it wasn't working for me. And I talked with my critique partner who is, she actually just got to announce her debut deal, Sierra Godfrey. So I'm very excited for her because I was like, I wish I could just take this story and put it in space or something like that. And she suggested like, well, why don't you do that? What's, what's the worst that could happen? You'll, you will get better as a writer by doing that. So I did that. And that was my third attempt at a manuscript. At the time it was called The Pause. And that released in 2020 as a beginning at the end, that is my pandemic story that released <laughs> right before a pandemic. So even though that one got shelved for a while, my agent pulled it off. 
Um, and that's something that we can talk about, have an agent that's willing to look through your back catalog and rescue your beloved stories. And so it was my third attempt at querying, but my fourth manuscript, which became Here and Now and Then. And that's the one that I got my agent with. Can you tell us more about the moment that you realized that you wanted to be a published author, that you wanted to see a book that you had written on bookshelves? It was weird. It was, I had started to write, well, I, I the, the book that turned me onto thinking like, I can do this was High Fidelity by Nick Hornby. And then About a Boy, which is still one of my favorites. Like that's the book that I kind of go back to when I feel like, I need to look at character work or, or like pacing or something like that. It's just, it's a perfect book. And, and so we, we've always kind of pitched my stuff as like Nick Hornby in the apocalypse or Nick Hornby writes, <laughs> um, you know, superheroes or something like that. So that was probably about like 2000 when I first picked up High Fidelity and it just kind of started bubbling around. But like I knew between that and my creative writing professor, it was definitely something that I kept thinking about, but it wasn't until I, I made a conscious choice to like to take time away from sports journalism to like, I really want to focus on this. So probably about 2008, 2009-ish was when I really tried to start improving my craft. So once you made that decision, how did you go about learning more about the publishing industry, like how it works, how to get a book published, how to write a query letter, all of those things? It was a weird time. Because I think the industry was transitioning from like paper, <laughs> it seems so antiquated to say it now, but like to paper query letters to to email. And I remember it might have been the query tracker boards. It, it was some some boards or some form where people were like, do not query people who only accept snail mail. Because I think about 25% of the industry was like still snail mail at that time. And they were like, if they can't get with email in like the year 2010 or whatever, they're like, you don't want to work with them. <laughs> I do remember my first partial request, and this is for one of my contemporary manuscripts in like 2008. It was a email request, but they requested the manuscript by paper, and I got a rejection for it on paper. <laughs> That's so weird. Which it, it, I might still have it in my closet somewhere. Like I, I did, I did keep some of that stuff. It was a weird learning curve because, like, you could tell things were changing, but I think the actual, the query letter itself is basically the same thing, and that took a lot of work because I just was not used to writing that at all. And it's funny because now, like, before we go on proposal with something. I write something in the form of a query pitch and it feels like it comes so naturally to me now. Um, and anytime I come up with a story idea, I try to write it in like a two paragraph query pitch to see if it works, but it took a long time to, to actually get there. I even have a book um, upstairs where it's like one of those, like, so you want to be published books. <laughs> and it talks about like, you know, you have to query agents and, you know, do all that stuff. And so it was a, it was a really weird time for that because it was these listings for agencies and online guidelines for how do you submit to them? Like all of that was still very new. I remember like Nathan Bransford, his blog was like the place that everyone got information. Mm -hmm. And then he just disappeared from the industry like three years afterward. <laughs> he actually announced that he was leaving agenting the day after I queried him. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was like, it wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you pushed him over the edge, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think because I queried three manuscripts and I felt like I got better at it each time, but I also understood the industry more each time. And so like I, I by the time I got into it for here and now and then, like I had my spreadsheets, like I knew like you should query at like, you know, groups of five once, you know, every week, try to do a cadence. So like there's things moving at the same time. And I subscribed to a query tracker. I don't know if query tracker still has a membership service. Mm -hmm. It was really, really great because of the way that like everyone puts in their aggregate data. So you knew roughly where you were in the queue and you knew that like, if it was taking longer then maybe they were considering your query, you, you know, like all those little types of things, which just makes 
life so much easier to, to process when you're when you put your heart out there to you know 80 agents or whatever one of the weird things with me was because i was doing these family stories in you know time travel or in space or whatever and so i wasn't sure what genre to query so i actually did science fiction literary fiction commercial fiction and women's fiction because and so because of that i was able to cast a wide net and i found a pretty pretty equal response rate across each genre and my final like when i got offers eric does uh literary fiction and science fiction so he kind of hit both i had two science fiction agents and then one uh literary fiction agent so i I did still kind of hit the spectrum with that nice so then what happened can you break down for us your journey from then to signing your first book contract so w- with deciding to go with Eric across multiple offers, well, so let me say, that, so the first, the first offer I got was the literary fiction agent. And then I had that like 24 hours where I was just like emailing all the agents that I'd queried with, you know, like I've got an offer and I felt so powerful. And it was like the first time in this industry where I'm like, I hold all the power right now. I am <laughs> I am Zeus on Mount Olympus throwing emails from the top. So I got uh I got four offers and I interviewed each of them and I actually just uh someone someone had emailed me with advice about this and so I just wrote out all these notes for her. Um and I still feel the same way with this where I made a decision based on editorial feedback. You know, I asked about like communication and you know career goals and things like that um but when i asked each of the agents about what feedback do you have from my manuscript there were there's something off with each of them um which it wouldn't have made the book i think it would have worked but it would have been different from what i wanted to do except for eric's feedback which was like you know he nudged it in all the ways that made complete sense to me so that's that's ultimate like after i talked with him i actually had one more person to talk to after that but i knew after that like he really really gets it so that's how that came about and then we went on sub for almost two years which was terrible (laughs) so i think the industry is different now it's much more open to diverse speculative fiction stories so this is 2015 and i think it had just started to turn the corner a willingness to move away from like standard space opera, epic science fiction, or e- epic fantasy, and like hard science fiction. Like you had really started to see things starting to break through there. But we got, I went to acquisitions five times in 20 months. Oh my gosh. And so it was like maybe every three to four months it would happen. And it was split evenly between literary fiction imprints and science fiction imprints. And they were like, the the result was always like a mirror image of the other. The, the literary fiction imprints would say like, this is too science fiction for our literary imprint. And the science fiction imprints would say, this is too literary for our science fiction audience. And so I had talked with one of my agent siblings and he said that he set an internal like calendar of 18 months for a project to be on sub. And so I'm like, okay, 18 months. I can live with that. Like, cause at that point, I think I was at 12 months. So I told Eric that and I said, and that's actually when Eric pulled the pause slash a beginning at the end off the shelf. Cause we started to think like, what can we do next? So I said like, let's go for 18 months. That would have been, I think May of 2015 or 2017 at that point. And as we approached it, I believe it was April. He said, I've just um, talked with a few editors and there's one at Mira, which is a Harlequin imprint, and she really wants the next Time Traveler's Wife. And I told her the pitch, and she said it gave her goosebumps. So can we please just send it to her and maybe a few other people and just see what happens? And I was like, okay, we, you know, we're at 18 months. I can wait for like 20 months. That's fine. And she's the one that offered. And I remember I was so beaten down at that point that like, like we knew when they were going to have the acquisition meeting, like actually it was because Eric was about to go on paternity leave. So his son was, his wife was very, very pregnant at that point. So the editor, Michelle Mead, who is now a freelance editor, she said, uh, we're going to have the acquisitions meeting on this day 
I will call you right afterwards so you can go on paternity leave. <laughs> Um, and so I was actually on chat with my friend Diana Urban, who is a YA author. I actually I screen capped this on my like how I got a book deal blog post. And you can see the chat where like we're actually talking about it. And like I'm saying, like, I don't think it's going to happen. I've been, you know, I've been punched in the face by publishing enough. You know, it's, and then Eric texted me with he just said, it's time. <laughs> and then so like this, this <laughs> real time chat with Diana, I, like I say, like, oh, my God, Eric just texted me this. And then he called like a minute later. And so I was at my day job. So I went outside of this, you know, massive building and kind of like stood in the alley of a parking lot and just kept saying like, I don't believe it. Because, and I didn't believe it. It was so weird to finally, you know, after, you know, falling on my face so many times at acquisitions to finally have it happen. And so like, even now it's kind of weird thinking about it. Cause that was four years ago. And I just like this afternoon I turned in, my line edit for my fourth book so that's done and i've written for star wars <laughs> too so to think about like you know it, it doesn't seem like that long of a span for all of this stuff to have happened and it all started off so horribly like when you when you sign with an agent you think like it's going to be a smooth path it's going to be like all of my dreams are going to come true you know all this stuff and then for it to like be protracted into like this, you know, 20 month nightmare of like getting your hopes up and then exploding, you know, four times. It's, it's weird to look back on it now. It's funny. Cause I just last night actually recorded an interview with Suzanne Park mm -hmm. who had a very similar experience, except they actually went out on sub. They finally sold the fourth book that they went out on sub. Oh with. God. I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, every book had gone to acquisitions. And so by the time the book that finally sold went on acquisitions, she was just like, oh, this, this again, you know, like, <laughs> not having any faith in what would happen. And then that was the one who did it. So yeah. Can you read your successful query letter for us? So this is the query letter for here and now and then that I started querying in spring of 2015 and got me my agent. Ken Stewart thought parenting a teen couldn't get any harder, but then he got separated from his daughter by a century. Before that, he was a normal family man working in parenting teenage Miranda, a far cry from his old job as a time-traveling secret agent from the year 2142. Stranded in suburbia since the 1990s because of a botched mission, he'd spent the last 17 years thinking about soccer practices and family vacations instead of temporal fugitives. But when his rescue team suddenly arrives, Kin is forced to abandon his family and return to 2142, where everyone, including his fiancée, who's unaware of time travel, thinks he's only been gone weeks, not years. Ordered to cut all contact with the past, Kin defies his superiors and attempts to raise his daughter from the future. Until one day he discovers that Miranda's been erased from history and it might be his fault. With time running out, Miranda's very existence depends upon Kin taking a final trip across time, no matter the cost. Break time travel rules, tell his fiancée about Miranda and his secret family, even put his own life on the line. Those are risks Kin will take because there's only one thing more important than the past and the future, doing right by his daughter. All right, so how has your experience been since signing that first book contract, especially were there any surprises along the way? I think the, the surprises have been pleasant surprises. I, I think like, you know, that first year, the first book, nothing can really prepare you for it. So, you know, I was in a debut group and we're all kind of, flying by the seat of our pants and and i was fortunate that like some of my agent siblings you know had already gone through this process and i had some other friends that kind of talked me through it but it's still like this really very personal very intense thing that you can't really talk to people about i mean like you can't understand it by talking to someone about it like you just have to experience it mm -hmm. i was just gonna say every time i try to like complain about something publishing related to like my coworkers, it requires like an hour backstory explanation yeah, for exactly. them to even understand. <laughs> yeah. Like I, 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 I basically kept it completely separated from my, you know, my day job life. A few people, they know about it and like, you know, they're, they're the ones that I, you know, actually like to talk to 
Um, but in general, I, I just pretend it doesn't exist when I'm dealing with the day job. It's just, it's simpler uh, that way. But like, even with like friends and family, you know, the, if they don't understand publishing, you know, it's just everything comes with like this very strange context. And so with that first, that first book, it, it, I had to learn what that context was first, but like it got good reviews. It sold pretty well. I think one of the weird things with learning is there's going to be people who do better than you. And that's kind of a surprise. And then there's going to be people who do worse than you. And you might think like, I love their book. How did that happen? You just learn really fast that this industry is just, it's a weird mix of like marketing dollars and luck. And that was, that was kind of a shock to learn. With my second book, I was starting to ramp up to, like we were doing the pre-release publicity in like November, December-ish of 2019. And so, you know, I had all of my like little anecdotes about how like I wrote a pandemic book that it's a metaphor for trauma, but it's not a standard apocalypse book because it takes place during the rebuilding phase and it's all about community and connection and you know finding hope through found family so i started talking about that and then you know the whispers of like well there might be a real <laughs> pandemic coming and so that was a very terrible surprise <laughs> it was i i can't even really explain that i'm lucky that sarah pinsker and chuck wendig like they released books around the same time I did. And we got thrown into a bunch of panels together to talk about this, which was cool because, you know, it was nice to have people who like mutually understand how strange it was to like, we actually had a panel hosted by Reddit fantasy and it was bad crap that you wrote that came to life. It was <laughs> something like that. It was just a really unnerving thing. Like I, because in even in like the opening chapters, like there's there's discussion about like mask shaming and social distancing and people afraid to go into a room together and like hand sanitizer everywhere. And just like this really bizarre thing of like seeing these world building elements and it's like they're coming to life piece by piece, like conspiracy theories and people not trusting each other. And my stock line when people ask me like what came true and what didn't and my biggest thing about it not coming true is like you can tell my book is science fiction because there is faith in science and there was co competent government response <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that that was probably like the biggest unexpected terrible thing <laughs> other than that other than a pandemic i would say that the community i think we with the science fiction community i kind of was bracing you know like i write you know, more like literary style and I'm a person of color and I'm like, you know, entering old white dude ter territory. And I was very pleasantly surprised to, to find um, science fiction writers of America uh, or CIFWA as we like to call it, had really shifted in like the past decade with a much more inclusive and progressive leadership team and, and their agenda is represented as such. And so both the online community and like the in-person events that I've done, like I've felt completely welcomed. I, I felt like, you know, people were eager to talk me through like any nerves that I might've been having or, you know, just questions that I had about like, how do you survive this? And that was a really, really pleasant surprise. And I really try to pass that forward. Nice. Yeah. We've definitely seen a lot of changes, especially in Sifwa. I really admire Mary Robinette, especially. Yeah, she's, she's great. She's done a lot of work. All right, it is time for the quick round. I call it author DNA. Uh, I know you're an engineer. It has nothing to do with DNA. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the classifications we sometimes put writers in. Are you a pantser or a plotter? I'm mostly plotter with some pantser flexibility. <laughs> do you tend to be an overwriter or an underwriter? Underwriter at first. I write in layers. So my first draft is always about like half of the final manuscript. Do you tend to write better in the morning or at night? I write whenever I can. <laughs> I, I have a young child. <laughs> parents always, that's usually the answer for parents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you start with a new story, do you typically start with a character or plot or concept or something else first? A little bit of all of that. I usually take a general concept and a rough character sketch and then I write a query out of it to see if it holds up. Do you prefer coffee or tea? 
coffee, black coffee with my friend Pun Shepherd, who wrote the book of M and the upcoming The Cartographers. She introduced me to the concept of putting cayenne pepper in black coffee, and it is mm. the best thing. It's just like you get your black coffee, and it's just a tiny kick of heat. So I, I live off black coffee. Whenever you're writing, do you prefer silence or some kind of sound? Please silence. <laughs> <laughs> Please silence. I have so much noise in my life. And when it comes to the first draft, are you more of a get it down kind of person or a get it right? get it down uh, i hate first drafting i really enjoy revising because i feel like i know it much better at that point so first draft is just to get it out so i can start thinking about it properly what tools or software do you use to draft i do everything on google docs because it backs up immediately and i can write on my phone that way do you prefer drafting or revising more you kind of already answered this but <laughs> yeah definitely 100 percent revising do you write in sequential order or do you hop around? I write in acts. So act one, act two, a act two, B act three. And as I write each individual act, I write in roughly sequential order. But if, if I hit a spot where I feel like it's not working, I'll just jump ahead a chapter. And last quick round question. Are you an extrovert or an introvert? I discovered the term social introvert a few years ago, which is exactly what I am. And a lot of writers are like this, where I really love hanging out with close friends, not strangers and not coworkers, <laughs> uh, but, but friends, but I have a limit. And I, after like two or three hours, I need to go be by myself and recharge. So the show is called Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. We're going to talk about that second cue now. What were some of the worries that you had on your journey and were they realized or did you overcome them or how did they shake out? I think like Post-agenting, pre-publication, it was, am I ever going to succeed at acquisitions? And so obviously, like, you know, that 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 worked out. Man, like, acquisition nerves, like, I try, like, when, when I have friends who get agented for the first time, like, I try to, like, you know, prepare them all for how unnerving that is. But th there's there's really no way to, to comprehend it because you, it's, like, this immensely personal yet professional thing, and you feel like you're being judged you know, and you feel like your life could shift this way or that way. I'm glad I'm I'm at a point in my career where I feel like, you know, it's I, I'm in a, a little bit of control. Like you're never in full control in publishing, but to, to actually get there has been it's quite a relief. And now for the third cue, do you have any writing quirks? Is there anything about your writing process that you think is kind of different or interesting or unique? Yeah, you know, I thought, so the way that I, I said I draft in layers, and I thought that wasn't too weird, but people have told me that, like, wow, that's very innovative, and, like, I, I never really thought it was. So the first draft for me is really, really hard to get out, um, and sometimes it's just dialogue and bullet points for a chapter, because I just want to get it out, because I, I think very, very visually, and sometimes, like, I can't wrap my head around, like, prose just yet, so I just need to know, like, this character says this, they move over here, this thing happens. And so my my main word count target for, for a book is, for a finished book, is about like 90 to 95,000 words. My first drafts often come in about 40 to 45,000 because it's, dialogue comes easiest for me. So that's what I, like, that will just come out naturally. But then the stage direction is often just bullet points. And then, so like the first, the first pass is that, the second pass is actually filling in those bullet points and giving it actual prose. It might not be good prose, but you know it's actually there. It's pretty light on world building too. Third pass is to insert world building elements, and then fourth pass is to smooth it all over. And I do this act by act. And the, the purpose of that is if I can get a good act one done, then I feel like I know the characters much better. So then when I get to act two, it will hopefully be shorter and I will have less to like remove and clean up. <laughs> so I guess I, it's kind of a quirky thing. And, and I didn't think it was that weird until people told me it was really weird. But <laughs> yeah, So it works for me because I feel like it by doing the act, act one first, I feel like you can know your characters as well as you would if you wrote the whole manuscript. But if there's a terrible plot problem, you don't have to undo you know, 95,000 words, you only have to undo <laughs> 20,000 words. I do something similar, but I don't break it by act. But it's, my first draft tends to be very spare. It's just like plot and dialogue. Yeah. I'm told it sometimes reads like a screenplay. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And then usually my second around is basically adding in setting. <laughs> I feel like um, the first draft is kind of like a, a pencil sketch. And then like every after that, you start layering in like colors and backgrounds and things like that. Mm -hmm. When you were in the lowest parts of your journey, what kept you going and why did you stick to it? Boy, that, that's that's hard because I, I, I think everyone is super excited when they announce to their non-writer friends that like I've got an agent and then the questions start asking like oh when's the book release party and you know things like that they don't they don't quite understand that like you're basically only halfway there and so after constantly failing at acquisition it was it, it was really hard to deal with and I think it's really important to get a close group of friends that you can be honest with and I think because I kind of felt like a jerk complaining about it to my friends who were still querying because they're like, Oh, but you have an agent. Like, why are you complaining? And you know, I, I didn't, I, I didn't want to go there with them. So it was important to find people that you could be completely honest with who were at the same stage or a little ahead or a little behind. So it was all a very communal experience. Two things that I did that were very productive for me when I was going through the acquisition stuff, Eric told me to uh, try writing short stories. And then also when we pulled the pause off the shelf and he read it and he, he said, I really like this, but like, here's my like massive structure destroying uh, suggestion. <laughs> so I took it from a two point of view, linear story to a four point of view, like nonlinear with flashbacks and, and like media reports and all this other stuff. It was like the hardest thing that I ever did because and it was also like, because I originally wrote it in like 2011, 2012. So like, it just wasn't as good. Like I'd learned so much at that point. So I had to like start to deconstruct these characters that I'd really become fond of, but you know, there were still bad writer habits in there. So working on something else. So the short story that I published um, actually became my third book, We Could Be Heroes. And then the, the manuscript that I worked on at the time, was, which was called The Pause, that sold as my second book, A Beginning at the End. So everything that I worked on during that period to, like, to stay occupied and keep my mind off of the terrible sub process turned into something that came out later. I think that's the only thing that you can do in publishing you have to keep working on stuff because even if you sign that book there's going to be long lulls between edits and between revisions and you're going to need people are going to start asking for the next thing so just keep working on new stuff yeah make friends and write new things That's mm -hmm. great great way to cope in this industry did you make any mistakes along the way that you would maybe like to warn listeners about so they don't make the same ones i think just understand that there's always further material down the line. There's always further options. If you jump at like the first opportunity, even though it might not be like, it's worse to sign with a bad agent or like a bad small press than something that like is actually supportive of you. And I know it's really tempting to be like, Oh, this, this person or this, this company, like they liked my material. I'm going to jump. But it could lock you into something bad. And like I, I'm lucky that I haven't personally experienced this, but I've had friends who go through that and they've had to like back out of their situations and it's messy and it's not comfortable for anyone. And so it's just important to like really do your due diligence when you get an offer. You know, make sure it is not just something that you accept to, to get to the next stage, but is actually a good fit for what you want with your career. Can you share with listeners one of the most important lessons that you learned on your journey to publication? I'm really appreciative of Eric pulling a beginning at the end off the shelf. And I, I think it shows that like, even though it went through massive, massive rewrites, I, I, I remember when, when I told uh, one of my friends who is an agent, who is not my agent, when I told her uh, what we had to do to get that ready she said like that sounds like the decathlon of editing and i'm like yeah it pretty much was but it shows that like no story is ever totally dead you know there there are bits and pieces of it that can always be mined for further material and actually i'm dealing with that now with my, my work in progress so 
my fifth book, which is going to come out, <laughs> assuming I finish it, which will come out in January 2023, is called uh, Vampire Weekend. And it's, it's about a punk rock vampire. And my first book that I tried to write was about a local band and like musicians and things like that. And so there's elements of those characters from that first book that I've just transposed into Vampire Weekend you know, those ideas are never dead. Like they can, they can be changed or mutated or evolved into something else. I call this the acknowledgements portion of the podcast. This is not a business that most of us succeed in completely on our own. You've mentioned some of them along the way, but who are some of the people who helped you along your path? This is good because I have just wrote my acknowledgements for light years from <laughs> home. I just turned that in. So like, this is kind of, you know, in my head. So in addition to my agent, uh, who I've you know, clearly talked about a lot, so my critique partner, Sierra Godfrey, who is going to debut in fall of 2022, she and I have been supporting each other, I think, since like 2007, 2008 or so, like with both writing and like we, we did, um, went to a business partnership together for a bit. And so like we've just kind of seen each other through this and we, we have as critique partners, we called it brutally diplomatic feedback, where we are diplomatic with each other, but we are brutally honest. You know, we agreed, like, we're going to say the, the tough things to each other because we want each other to succeed. So it's really important to, to get people like that. So, so Sierra Godfrey is, you know, just someone who's been with me along the way. Kat Howard, who has one of my favorite books of all time called An Unkindness of Magicians, she helped me with, with a really hard revision for Here and Now and Then, and then she helped me with my impossible <laughs> revision for A Beginning at the End. She has read parts of all of my early drafts, even including Vampire Weekend, which she sent me feedback on that a few months ago. So I, I tell everyone that because she's a freelance editor, in addition to being a teacher and a novelist, and I recommend her to everyone. And I, I say, like, I would literally not be here if it wasn't for Kat. If you're having trouble with your manuscript, you can go, please hire her. She's, she's absolutely the best. My agent sibling group. So I know this has become more and more common. I think we were one of the first groups to actually do this, where someone started a Slack. And it's just our the agent siblings. And you have to like each other. <laughs> that really helps. Um, Eric is a really good judge of character, so we all like each other. And I, I, it's really nice to have people who understand like the exact processes that you're going through. And also, like someone can put out in there, like, hey, who's got a manuscript with Eric? Like, what's taking his time right now? So we can all get a sense of what's going on. But generally, we're just supporting each other. Like when someone goes to acquisitions or you know, gets a deal or something falls apart, you know, like we're just there for each other. And so those are the biggest ones. And I will also say that I chat regularly with authors in my genre and outside of my genre. You know, I have a small circle that like, you know, we talk at least a few times a week. And it's just nice to be with, to discuss stupid industry things with people who get it because this industry does not make sense. So most of the time, you know, we'll be, talking about video games or or something like that but then like when we have an actual industry question with like how did you handle this or like i need to bonk an idea off of you or something like it's it's good to have like that inner circle out there so shout out to diana urban wendy heard megan scott mullen and pun shepherd some of which i've already referenced in here nice can you tell listeners about your latest release? Sure. So We Could Be Heroes came out um, this past January, and it is a story of a superhero and a supervillain who decide to become friends because they, they both don't know where they got their powers and decide that, like, hey, we can help each other here. It's a story about unlikely friendship and identity. It is not a gritty <laughs> Marvel or DC <laughs> story. It's definitely something much more character-driven than that. And I'm still surprised at my editor letting me play around with like different subgenres and stuff. Because when I pitched like a superhero buddy story and they bought it, I was like, really? Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me ramble about this weird industry we're in. Oh, yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. You can find the text of Mike's query in the show notes, 
along with links to find out more about him and his books. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review, tell your friends, or share this episode on social media. If you're interested in supporting the show, go to patreon.com slash pubtalklive. And if you're a published author interested in being a guest on the show, please click on the home base link in the description or go to sarahnicholas.com and click on the podcast logo in the sidebar. That is Sarah with an H and Nicholas with no H. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.